In Australia's remote northeast, big plans are in the pipeline. The largest coal mine in the country, and one of the biggest in the world, is going to be built here. The Indian company behind the mine says it will create thousands of jobs. But at what cost? I'm Steve Chow. On this episode, 101 East investigates whether the mine will mean riches or ruin for Australia. Can we go together? Yeah, why not? We do everything together. <laughs> right. Bruce and Annette Curry's cattle station is on the edge of an area called the Galilee Basin in the northeast of Australia. Life here isn't for the faint-hearted. The climate's harsh and the land drought-stricken. We'll up the fence this way, maybe that tree, and then we'll just try and guide them across around those tanks. Yeah. But in the past few years, they've reached breaking point. The couple is fighting for survival as the coal mining industry, led by Indian company Adani, marches into the region. If that Adani mine goes ahead, it's going to be devastating. It'll destroy the Galilee Basin because uh, the Adani mine, if it starts, the rest of the mines will come in behind it. The Curry's biggest concern is having to share their most precious resource. Groundwater is unromantic and uh, as unsexy as it is, it's the most essential element to life. And if we don't have it, it would jeopardise our viability here. We've got two bores on the property, so if either one of those bores is impacted, we lose the water supply to half of that place. The Curry's property spreads across 25,000 hectares. Beneath its dry surface is one of the world's largest and deepest underground water systems, known as the Great Artesian Basin. It underlies more than a fifth of the continent, and for many in the country's arid centre, it's the only source of fresh water. For the Curries, it's the lifeblood of their pastoral business, and they believe it's under threat from the coal miners. The only certainty we get is whatever groundwater they destroy in their mining operations is lost for perpetuity. And probably worse still, if they impact on the quality, uh, that's, that's a real concern because there's no way of cleaning that water again. You know, being a humble person... The Currys fear they could ultimately lose their livelihood and the stress of that is taking its toll. I just want to get on and go back to the way we were before all of that started. I just want to run my business and it's very frustrating. So physically it's been, it's been draining, but for me, emotionally, it's, it's hard. It's been hard, yeah. We've got no support from government and actually they're trying to make it easy for the companies to get in and uh, walk all over the top of landowners. So the impact on something like the Great Artesian Basin, to, to have that destroyed, just doesn't bear thinking. It's it's just a barbaric, callous, uncaring act. I challenge anyone uh, to claim that this mine has not been subjected to the most stringent environmental assessments and controls. And what government's responsibility is, is to get the balance right uh, environmentally, socially and economically. And I'm confident that that will happen with the development of Galilee. What I'm saying is... Australian Conservative Senator Matt Canavan has been a driving force behind the government's backing of Indian energy giant Adani. What does Adani mean to Queensland? A fresh stake in the... The company proposes to build Australia's biggest and one of the world's largest coal mines. The catch cry is jobs for a region where unemployment is high and the delivery of electricity to millions of India's poor. Adani is proud to build a long-term future with Queensland. Coal is, is our second biggest export uh, in the country, $35 billion a year. 
Uh, it helps fund our schools, our hospitals, our public services. So opening up the Galilee Basin could add around $10 billion to our export revenue. Huge benefit. The coal-rich Galilee Basin covers an area greater than the United Kingdom. Adani's mine is in the heart of it, surrounded by wildlife and cattle stations. The company says it will start work on the $16 billion operation here in October. So we're now on the Adani mine lease. As you can see, there's little here at the moment, but the proposed mine will span some 30 kilometres and include massive open cut and underground mines. At its peak capacity, it'll produce 60 million tonnes of coal a year. From the Galilee Basin, the coal will be transported almost 400 kilometres by rail to the company's port at Abbott Point on the Great Barrier Reef, then shipped to India. Adani is banking on a $700 million low-cost loan from the Australian government to help fund the construction of the railway. No major Australian bank is prepared to back the company, believing global climate change policies undermine the financial viability of new coal projects. And it seems finances aren't the only challenge Adani's facing. Just eight kilometres from the planned mine site are the Dungmabula Springs. The water comes from the Great Artesian Basin and feeds into the Carmichael River that runs through the mine site. A scene of tranquility today, but a fierce battle is raging to protect them for the future. We're fairly emotional about this thing. The thing is, they would be basically raping our mother. That's how we see it. And that's why we're saying no means no. Adrian Baragaba and his niece, Marawa Johnson, are from the local indigenous community, the Wongan and Jangalingu people. The springs are integral to their culture and traditional ceremonies, and they believe they're in danger of drying up if the mine proceeds. Our dreaming story of the rainbow serpent is about the water, and the water is life for us. So the government has attacked our dreaming and allowed a foreign mining company, some Indian person that has no respect for our law and custom, come into our country and destroy our rainbow serpent dreaming. We've been given a duty to keep the springs going, the rivers flowing, to protect the water. And if the threat to the water is the mine, then we have to stop the mine. And it's just that simple. The Wongan and Jengalingu people twice refused to sign an indigenous land use agreement with Adani. But the Aboriginal community is divided, and last year an agreement was signed. They voted 293 to 1 in favour. 293 to 1 is a pretty uh, uh, ec ecstatic uh, uh, and enthusiastic support for the mine. It was a scam meeting. Adani uh, busts in like um, 200 people who aren't our people. Accusing the company of corrupting the voting process, Adrian and Marawa's families are now challenging the agreement in the courts. They manufactured an outcome by getting random Aboriginal people from all over the countryside to come in. They paid them to put their hand up. So it's not a true decision of the Wangana Jagalingu people. Um, we know who we are, we know where we come from, and we know what our responsibilities are. What detrimental impact the proposed Adani mine will have is obviously a matter of speculation, but many believe the company's history in India should set alarm bells ringing. As the country's biggest producer of energy, it's been accused of environmental destruction, exploitation of workers, corruption and fraud. The man behind the Indian corporate powerhouse is Gautam Adani. He's a rags to riches story. In less than three decades, the Adani family has risen to become one of the richest in India, worth more than $8 billion. And along the way, it seems they've cultivated powerful political allies. Everybody knows 
that the rise of Gautam Adani and the Adani industries is simultaneous with the rise of our Prime Minister Narendra Modi ji. Anand Yagnik is a prominent human rights and environmental lawyer in India's western state of Gujarat, where Adani has its headquarters and when Narendra Modi served as chief minister from 2001 to 2014 our prime minister before he got elected as a prime minister in the election campaign as a chief minister he went to uh, delhi in the adani plane not in indian airlines not in india air india and anyagnik's been spearheading cases against adani since the mid 1990s from the day one they have been after me but uh, they are very warm very loving in trying to convince me that i should stop litigating against them i should accept their retainership i have resisted all efforts and i will continue to resist all efforts so long as mr adani continues to mutilate my motherland to investigate some of the claims being made against adani we're heading to the gujarat coastal town of mundra Here the company holds more than 7000 hectares of government land most leased to it in the mid 2000s for as little as 1 cent a square meter on it it's built the country's biggest private port and the second largest coal power plant as well as a special economic zone here it's sublet land at up to 1000 times the amount it paid it's been a massive windfall for adani but for local cattle herders like Shaka Ibrahim it's been anything but his village and many others have lost all their common grazing land to the company we had 1400 acres of land at one point but all the grazing land for our cows has been taken and big bungalows and buildings have been built raat lagen po asai dhanto nahi hai i'm scared if i can't run my business what will my kids do no company is going to give them jobs i can't even educate them because it's also expensive every day shaka ibrahim has to herd his cattle through an open sewer then several kilometers before he finds a patch of grazing land The cows need a safe path. But we now have to take them on the highway. There is so much traffic there. All of this used to be grazing land. There were no boundaries, no walls, no fences. Behind these high walls is a Danish special economic zone or SEZ. In 2014, the Gujarat High Court found the zone was illegally developed without environmental clearance and shut it down. But it wasn't long before it was back in business. After Narendra Modi became Prime Minister of India, the Ministry of Environment and Forest granted the first set of uh, environmental clearances. And I want to confront Mr. Gautam Adani and ask a question. Have you complied with the terms and conditions of environmental clearance? The answer is no, according to four independent reports commissioned by government departments and the judiciary. They all found Adani bypassed and flouted environmental laws. Adani hamare liye ek bhookamp ki tarah aaya. Adani was like an earthquake for all of us when he first came here. The environmental violations by Adani have brought about tremendous suffering for locals and the government has done little about it. Narendra Gadvi heads up a local NGO. He says Adani's mega power plant operation has devastated local crops. by failing to properly seal the seawater intake canal and storage pond hum dekh sakte hain mere you can see how green and lush this area is but because of increasing salinity levels in the groundwater our farming is being impacted the lives of farmers have really gone down so what's happening here here hum dekh sakte hain photograph plants these are photos of fly ash from adani's power plant You can see they have dumped all the fly ash on the roadside. 
Fly ash is a dangerous toxic dust created when burning coal. They are not supposed to just dump it anywhere, as it could have an impact on people's health. For more than 10 years, Gadvi's NGO has gathered evidence of violations for legal cases against the company. To show us what he claims to be the impact of Adani's developments on the coastal environment, we're heading out along a river with some local fishermen. According to environmental clearance conditions, sand dunes and mangroves must be preserved and creeks mustn't be blocked or reclaimed. But it's not long before Gadvi's pointing out breaches. We are seeing Adani has cut and destroyed the mangroves here. This creek has been completely blocked. The dredging pipes pump sand to reclaim land. And not far from the shore, dredging machines continue working. After God, Adani is one person who can create land. And once they create the land, they sell it off to other companies at a huge profit. On another creek nearby, we hit a wall of sand. We can see Adani has dumped dredging material here and has blocked the creek. That's why we won't be able to sail any further. This mangrove forest was all around. But today you can see Adani has completely destroyed the mangroves in this region. Rahum Tullah's family have fished in the area for more than a century. He says they were once able to throw nets down in the local creeks, but now they have the added cost of boats. We could walk to the water before, but now we need diesel because we have to go further to find places where we can fish. Worse still, he says, their catch is now a quarter of what it was. The catch used to be really good. There were plenty of fish in this sea. The big fish would lay their eggs in these mangroves. So we were never short of fish. Forced to take out a high interest loan to survive, his life has become desperate. They have taken our livelihood away. So we pray that God sends a tsunami and puts an end to our lives. We want relief from this situation. What do we feed our children? The view across the waterfront development reveals a carpet of reclaimed land. This is a land which is created by throwing the sand on the mangrove forest. They say mangrove forest was never there. I'm sorry, you take a satellite image and you will be able to come to know. This satellite image shows how the coastline looked 12 years ago. This is today. We have been telling the Ministry of Environment and Forest that these are a bunch of uh, hardcore liars. Hmm? What other evidence that you would want to see that they have mutilated the sea coast of Mundra in, in the name of industrialization? It is a mutilation. The problem we face is that we are fighting people who have a lot of money and the government is supporting the rich and the powerful. The company goes to any extent to silence any form of opposition and to cover up the matter. First, they tried to buy us over. But we didn't give in, so they implicated us in a false case. They did that to me in 2014, and I was stuck in a jail for five or six days. Narangadvi says these photographs were taken after he and his brothers were beaten by security guards when they tried to enter a local forest near the special economic zone. But according to Adani, the activist has attacked its officers and trespassed on company land. Gadvi says last year, Adani tried a different approach. Adani himself called me asking me to stop helping these farmers. 
He said he would give me whatever I want. I said I don't want anything from you. I just want justice. The fear Adani provokes in the local community is intense. But this former power plant worker agrees to talk with us, providing his identity is hidden. He says environmental regulations are consistently breached at the debt-ridden plant to save money. The company is required to continuously operate a system to reduce dangerous sulfur emissions, but he says that doesn't happen. Adani installed this system, but they don't run it full time. If there is an audit or a visit by the government, only then do they use that system. Otherwise, it is not used. He also says the company releases fly ash through the chimney stacks at night. In the evening, emissions can't be seen, as there is hardly any light or visibility. They do it because they want to save money, because electricity will be saved. They only are bothered about money. They don't think about people. The former worker says there are also serious safety issues at the power plant. In April last year, when a boiler was restarted, a block steam vent caused boiling water to escape. Tragically, men were painting the boiler at the time. All those working there got burnt and died. It was Adani's fault. This was a very wrong thing that happened at Adani. Because when startup happens, no one is allowed to work there. Because there is no way to escape and an accident could happen at any time. Eight workers died and 13 were seriously injured. Police have charged three power plant managers with criminal negligence. And accusations against Adani practices don't stop here. In 2011, a retired Supreme Court judge found Adani employees bribed customs officials, police and local politicians to allow the illegal export of iron ore through one of its ports. He recommended the company be blacklisted. To date, no action has been taken and Adani denies any wrongdoing. Back in Australia, Adani's plans for its mine are going full steam ahead. But here on the Great Barrier Reef, there's grave fears the mine could wreak havoc on a global scale and help destroy one of the natural wonders of the world. The decision to go ahead with the Adani mine is just about the most unbelievably uh, negligent uh, decision you could possibly imagine. It's the worst thing you could possibly do for the Great Barrier Reef. Charlie Verran is one of the world's leading marine biologists. He spent most of the past 50 years surveying coral reefs, earning him the nickname the Godfather of Coral. He says the bleached and dead coral here on the Great Barrier Reef is a sign the world's reefs are in crisis as a result of climate change. It's heating the oceans above their tolerance. And coral reefs worldwide are dying out. These last two years, we saw half the corals of the Great Barrier Reef die. It is that serious. It is entirely related to climate change. And climate change is driven by greenhouse gases, of which carbon dioxide is by far the most important and coal is the worst contributor of carbon dioxide now on the planet. Charlie Verran believes the carbon emissions from the extraction and burning of coal from Adani's mine will be catastrophic. That will provide as much carbon dioxide as all of Australia can produce in five to seven years. That's how much it is. It doesn't matter where it comes from, it doesn't matter where it's burnt. It winds up in the atmosphere. And if it goes ahead, what's your prediction for the reef? It will be dead. There's no doubt about that. It will, it will be dead. I might outlive the Great Barrier Reef, which is something um, 
unimaginable. And if the Great Barrier Reef goes, so too will the tourism industry around it, estimated to be worth more than $50 billion to the country's economy. What do you say to scientists who are saying that this coal mine is going to escalate the death of the Great Barrier Reef? Well, I think that's absurd. It's absolutely absurd. If anything, it will likely reduce global carbon emissions because our coal is of a higher quality than coal typically used in India. If we don't provide the best coal uh, that exists here in Asia, they'll burn lower quality coal. That'll mean higher emissions, that'll mean higher temperatures, and that'll be worse for the Great Barrier Reef. The Australian government is banking on jobs and royalties flowing from the Adani mine. But given the company's controversial track record in India, and with so much at stake, many wonder if the coal mine could be a disastrous mistake.